You ever been walking along in the woods, a hiking trail, or even a large park, and thought, boy, someone could really disappear in here? Well, for some unfortunate few, this reality was their nightmare. These people became new victims to the missing 401 phenomenon. There are really only two things that truly terrify me. One, UFOs. That's going to be covered in a later video, trust me. The second is having the strange feeling that you're being stalked, hunted down in the woods, or in, alone at home, and you can't tell from what, or where, or who, or why you're being stalked, or why you have this creepy sensation you can't get rid of. This is why I love looking into the missing 401. It creeps me out. For some, though, you might be wondering, what is Missing 411? Missing 411 is where hundreds, if not thousands, of people go missing into national parks or forests. Most of these cases take place in the national forest, like I said, that's not a hard requirement. Also, if you notice, here I am in the woods filming this. Since most Missing 401 cases take place in the woods, I figured I'd raise the stakes and film this video out in the woods at night. Anyway. Let's get back to the subject at hand. Subjects of missing 401 can sometimes be found alive. However, they have little to no memory of the incident. However, most of them are unfortunately found dead. But the strangest of all are when nothing is ever found of them. No remains, no equipment, anything. Missing 401 was coined by author David Politis. He's written extensively on the subject. And as far as the terminology means, missing is obvious, missing. And 401 is the information hotline. Think of 911 as emergency, 401 is information. Well, now that we know what a missing 401 case is, how do we classify a missing 401 case? Can't some people just get lost or eaten by a bear? Of course they can. Qualified case is a missing 401 case. First, there's a few set of rules that need to happen. If any of the following seem likely, it is immediately ruled out as a missing 401 case. One, being any kind of self-harm. Two, it's animal attacks or animal predation. Three, suspected foul play. Once those have been filtered out, then we start to notice other trends in these disappearances. Some of these disappearances are innocuous. These got lost, right? Some, however, the strange, and that's the ones we want to pay attention to. If you look at the strange ones, you start to notice trends in each one of these cases. A missing 401 case typically has some of these trends. Not necessarily all of them, but usually most. One, clusters. There are 52 clusters around the U.S. where these disappearances typically happen, as you can see here in this map. Are you near any of these hot spots? If so, I'd be careful next time you go out. Two is national forest. Most of these disappearances occur in state or national forest. Three, impossible distances traveled. If a body or remains are ever found, they're usually found very far away from where they originally disappeared. And usually the distance that is traveled doesn't make sense with the time that they were missing or the equipment they had when they were missing. Four, elevation changes. Usually if someone is found, they're found at significantly different elevations. Five, bodies of water. Typically, most of the bodies, unfortunately, that are found dead do end up being found near water sources. Six is memory loss. Subjects who are found usually have little to no memory of what happened, or if they do, their memory doesn't make sense, or their account of the situation sounds illogical, incorrect, or confused. Seven is missing clothing. Usually, if these bodies are found, they're either dead or alive, they're missing clothing. Strangely, though, it's usually only socks and shoes. Eight is dog confusion. Dog confusion means two things, technically. One, if someone di has disappeared with a dog, typically the dog shows up fine, unharmed, and is found almost immediately without their human. Two is when they bring tracker dogs out, the tracker dog cannot get a scent. Either they won't find a scent, or if they do, they'll go to a spot where there's no body, nothing, and they'll just stop and signal like, that's the last place that these people were. Nine is children. Unfortunately, a lot of these cases have to do with children. Some are tragically found dead or never found again. Others that are found alive, once again, usually have no good memory of what happened. Ten is have an evil name. Think of Devil's Passage, Devil's Woods, Devil's Forest, Devil's Kettle. Anything that has an evil name associated with it. For some reason, that seems to be a hot spot as well. I want to make a series out of the missing 411. For this first episode, I'm explaining what is the missing 411 phenomenon, and I will follow it up with two creepy cases. Any future episodes, however, won't deal with what is missing 411. Instead, it will be only the cases themselves. With all that being said, let's get into the first case. Garrett Bardsley. On Friday, August 20, 2004, Garrett Bardsley was on a fishing trip with his father 
on a Boy Scout camping trip. This camping trip took place in the Unida Mountains. These mountains are found in Utah. They plan on doing some fishing at a lake called Cuberant One. That morning, Garrett had managed to get his shoes, socks, and pants wet while fishing. He wanted to go back to the campgrounds and change his clothes. His father let him. His father didn't think of anything about it and let him go alone. This is because Garrett had walked this trail many times with no issues. Also, where they were at was only 150 to 200 feet away from the campgrounds. Let me stress that again, 150 to 250 feet. That's nothing. Even though Garrett's father didn't really think much of it, he kept an eye on Garrett as he walked back to the campgrounds. He kept an eye on him until he broke sight line at a tree line. He even, he even gave instructions to him as he was walking away, telling him to stay on the trail. This means from the broken line of sight to the campgrounds, it's only about 100 feet that Garrett was not seen by anyone. However, when this line of sight was broken, this was unfortunately the last time anyone had seen Garrett again. After 20 minutes or so, Garrett's father, Kevin, began wondering, man, where's Garrett at? So he went back to the campgrounds to check on him. No one there had seen him. Thought that was strange. So then they all started looking for him. They couldn't find him, and immediately search and rescue was called in. The search party consisted of hundreds of official and unofficial helpers. They were all aware that Garrett was last seen wearing a black sweatshirt, a reversible red and black sweatpants, and white Converse tennis shoes. He had no backpack, supplies, food, anything like that other than his fishing pole that he was last seen with. Even with all that help, Garrett was never found. None of his remains have even been found to this day. Not even his fishing pole that he was carrying was found. The only thing from Garrett's possessions that was found was a rolled up, crinkled, wet sock found about a half a mile away from his disappearance spot, and it was found in a granite field. Local police said there was no evidence of a kidnapping. There was also no evidence of a bear or animal attack of any sort. So if there was no evidence of foul play, no evidence of an animal, and none of his possessions or his body parts had ever been found, what happened to Garrett? Where did he go? On April 21st, 1981, 84-year-old Maurice Doc Dementez went on a camping trip with his friend David McSherry near Devil's Head, Colorado to do some rock hunting. There comes in that evil name again. Doc was a deeply religious man. He studied at the Denver Bible College. He then went on to study more of the gospel at many other colleges. He received up to a master's. Needless to say, Doc was very well read. had a deep understanding and love of two things. One, the gospel, and two, gems and minerals. Doc had arthritis and a blood disorder, and due to this, he couldn't walk very well. So he would often go to these dig sites with a friend to help him assist him walk around. That was David McSherry's role that day. Doc, who's last seen wearing a white baseball cap, a maroon plaid flannel, and brown ankle-high boots, needed help from David to get into his dig spot. Once David got in there and Doc got set up, David then went on to his dig spot. His dig spot was about 50 yards away. After a few hours of digging, David then went on to check on to Doc. He went on to let him know, like, hey, it's almost time to go. You need to start wrapping up and everything. David then went back to his spot 50 yards away to start cleaning up himself, wrapping up his, anything he found, his tools, cleaning them up after himself. Only 15 minutes later, David decided to walk back over to Doc so they can get ready to go. However, when he got there, Doc was gone. All of Doc's tools, his findings, Doc himself, Everything was gone. David, not only surprised that Doc could get out of his dig site alone, but also carry all of his tools, was very surprised. Well, so he thought, well, maybe Doc just has a good day. So maybe he got, Doc's already headed to the car. So he went to the car to see if Doc was waiting on him. Doc wasn't there. So he got there, waited for him for about 15 minutes, then started slamming the horn to alert Doc, like, hey, I'm at the car. Where are you at? He started become, then he started to become worried. Where's Doc? That afternoon, hours later, he was able to flag down a motorist. Remember, this is 1981, pre-cell phone. The motorist then was able to get in contact with the sheriff and search and rescue was then deployed. A five-day search then ensued. They searched in a grid pattern. They noticed at the site there was no signs of a struggle, blood, anything crazy. It would almost seem that Doc went willingly. It also proves that this was probably not an animal attack since there was no signs of a struggle or blood. However, even with all that help from the search and rescue team, Doc was never found. None of his supplies, his body, his remains, anything was ever found again to this day. After nine years of no evidence, he was then legally declared dead. What happened to Doc? Where did he go? Thank you so much for watching. I love the creepy, dark, and unknown. And I'm really now just starting to get into videography and photography. This was really neat to make. I've done a few ghost hunt videos with my brother recently. You might have seen them on the channel if they're posted already. They're currently being edited. We plan on releasing them throughout the month of October. 
And if they do well and we get permission to go to more locations, we're going to continue the ghost hunt. If you know of any place that will allow us to do a ghost hunt, preferably in the southeastern portion of the U.S., let us know in the comments below. I intend to make more conspiracy theory videos, missing 411, and strange and ghost videos. Stay tuned. Please hit the like and subscribe button if you'd like to see more. It truly helps. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Last time. That's fucking cool. That would have been cool to capture that. It would have.